I have like what, ten minutes left? Is that what it is? No, no, ten? No, no, okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Um, first, uh, thanks for having me, uh, Stephen and the organizers. Um, this is my first day actually being at the conference, but I've been keeping track online through Facebook and things like that, uh, <clears throat> which has been. Uh, at first, I was terrified because I realized no matter what I talked about, Stephen would say I wasn't talking enough about feeling. Um, and then I realized that if there's nothing I can do about it, then I might as well not worry about it. Um, so that was good. The other thing is you don't really get like a sense of who the audience is because I've been watching the videos and it's all focused up here. Um, so I had no idea like if there were going to be like two people or a thousand um, or who you guys were. So it's nice to see faces, uh, which is great. Um, so and also take my word that. Uh, I use like special fonts. This was really, really pretty. Um, so just imagine it being really beautiful. We'll see how everything turns out after transitioning. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, mind blanking, um, as you can tell, which is uh, when the stream of consciousness runs dry. And so the stream of consciousness is this kind of like, you know, what's sort of carrying us throughout our, our days and, and how we're piecing together our thoughts. Um, so let's get to it, because I think I have eight minutes left. Um, first, I want to talk about uh, angular and pools. Is anybody familiar with these? They're super cool. All right, well, I'm really into animals, um, so that's kind of why I want to throw this in here, but it actually does matter. Uh, what they are is uh, they're bodies of water that are both fresh and salt water. Uh, they're really prominent in South America, Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula. And what you have is you have a, south, or a saltwater ecosystem at the bottom, and usually you have either rainwater or a freshwater spring at the top. So you have a freshwater ecosystem at the top. And so you have uh, two completely separate ecosystems kind of swimming side by side, but they can never interact uh, because they live on different sorts of water. Uh, so you can have this fish up here who's a freshwater fish, and he's swimming around doing freshwatery things. This fish down here. Uh, doing saltwatery things, and they're in the same body of water, but they can never really communicate. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because I think this is a pretty good analogy for kind of the worlds of philosophy and psychology, in that we're kind of aiming to to look at the same questions, but uh, often we don't talk to each other, and when we pretend to, we're talking past each other. So hopefully that's not what's happening. Um, but I think this is a, a great uh, conference or institute because it's getting people together to actually talk about some of these things. So my training as, as a social cognitive psychologist, um, I'm interested in philosophy and I've kind of studied it, but not in any uh, kind of formal setting. Uh, but this is sort of the kind of definition of uh, social psychology, at least, that I subscribe to. Um, this is from Wagner and Gilbert in 2000. Uh, but it says, the center around which modern social psychology actually turns is the understanding of subjective experience. Sometimes it's concerned uh, with things social and sometimes not, but far, far more than any other field of psychology and far more than any other science, social psychology is intimately concerned with the scientific understanding of what it's like to be a person, why our existence at this moment in time and space feels the way it does. Um, so it's concerned with what it's like to be a person more so than what it's like to be a bat. But I think the parallels there are, are pretty obvious. Um, and it actually seems kind of similar to something I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, We're talking about the hard problem of consciousness, which is the problem of experience. And so I think we're both really interested in this idea of experience, of what it is like to be something. And I think we might be interested in different aspects of that. Uh, social psych tends to take for granted the fact that it is like something to be that. And so we want to know kind of how to mess with those things, whereas uh, philosophy might be asking different questions, uh, such as, why does it have to be like anything? Um, but what we're really focused on is this idea of experience. And so that's what I'm be focusing on, uh, but from the psychological perspective. So one difference that I noticed just watching the talks earlier today is that uh, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, experiments, um, mostly because they make me feel safe, because they're numbers. So I don't have to make a logical argument, which then somebody can say is wrong because I'm not good at thinking about things, I can just show numbers and say, here are some numbers, and you can inter or interpret them as you see fit. So that's nice for me. Um, so uh, first to get down to it, that was another thing that used to be prettier. 
Um, I just want to talk about the stream of consciousness, which is now gray, but those words are there. Um, there we go. Okay, so uh, this is John Locke, and I want to kind of use or draw on his uh, definition of consciousness, which is the perception of what passes in a person's own mind, and this is from 1689, and I know that we're all so much more refined than that now, but I actually think it's a pretty good working definition. Um, and then we have this idea of consciousness referring to either transitive or intransitive states. Uh, intransitive being sort of the levels of awareness, being awake versus asleep, in a coma, alive versus dead, etc. Um, and then the transitive consciousness being specifically what you are aware of, so what your attention is directed to. And I know there's been a lot of talk about kind of these distinctions between uh, attention and consciousness and how you can uh, be conscious of things you're not attending to and, and so forth and so on. But uh, Transitive consciousness is sort of these things that we are like aware of being aware of, in a sense. And so the, the research I'm going to talk about focuses more on this idea of transitive consciousness, the things we're aware of being aware of, because I think that's what, in large part, makes up our stream of consciousness. It's kind of the stories that we, we know about ourselves. It's the basis of explicit memories and, and so on. Um, so when we think about the stream of consciousness, um, this is some seven-year-old's crayon drawing of a stream. Um, I was told by a friend of mine who is a geologist that they did the silt banks on the wrong place, but uh, that's not the point. Um, so when we think about the stream of conscious, consciousness, we usually think about it as being this kind of uninterrupted flow of awareness, uh, often an uninterrupted flow of thought, um, because that's how it seems, right? If you're not aware, um, you're not aware of being unaware. Uh, so all the things that we remember, all the things that we draw on, are these times when we are aware. Um, and so this is something that William James said. So uh, I work in William James Hall at Harvard, and so uh, if you quote William James in a talk, then it makes everything you say true. And so I'm kind of keeping to that. I know I'm in a different place, uh, which is drawn out by the fact that I don't speak French, and so that has been obvious. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and stick, stick with this. And so he says in The Principles of Psychology, Within each personal consciousness, thought is sensibly continuous. And he defines that as being anything that doesn't have a breach, a crack, or division. So it's something that just keeps going. Um, but what if there are times when there are these breaches and, and cracks and divisions? What if uh, the stream of consciousness stops and starts up again? Uh, it turns out if you, if you read farther, he actually allows for the possibility of that. And he allows for the possibility of time gaps during which consciousness goes out altogether and then it comes into existence a moment later, sort of picking up where it left off. Um, and what he says is that this still is sensibly continuous because it feels unbroken, even though there are these gaps there. Um, but I want to focus on the possibility of those gaps existing and kind of try to see what that might mean for the study of consciousness. And so that's what I'm going to do and the research I'm about to talk about. Um, here we go. So another, uh, I guess, title for this talk would be the experience of not thinking anything, again, focusing on experience. Um, and uh, I guess the idea of being aware of what you're aware of. Um, and I do want to go back for a second and, and differentiate this from other sort of related concepts. So when I talk about mind blanking, um, I'm not talking about things like the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Right, which is when you're asked to produce information and you're very aware of the fact that you don't know what that is. You're thinking about how blank you are, but you're thinking, so you're not blank. Right. Um, so this kind of gets to this idea of consciousness and metaconsciousness, uh, thinking things, thinking about thinking things. It's not that. It's also not uh, mind wandering, which has been uh, explored uh, to a large extent, which is when you're thinking about something other than what you're doing. Sometimes you're thinking without being aware of what you're thinking. So getting back to the consciousness metaconsciousness distinction. Um, the idea going back to Locke's definition of the perception of what's in your own mind isn't just that uh, you're perceiving nothing, which would be this tip of the tongue phenomenon, or something's going on and you're not perceiving it. It's just that both are gone altogether. So, uh, Obviously, there's sort of a, a problem here, uh, the refrigerator door problem, so to speak. Um, so how do you know if the light in your refrigerator is always on. Uh, you don't really, because every time you open your refrigerator, your refrigerator door, the light's on. And so every experience you have of your refrigerator and its light is that this light is on. 
you don't know what happens when you close the door because you can't see inside of it. Um, and so we have this kind of same problem with the idea of your mind being blank. If you try to simulate the blank mind and think about what it's like, you've already failed because you're thinking about what it's like to not be thinking. Um, so we have an issue here. Uh, this is a may take man. He's not very happy about it. Um, of how to kind of get at this idea. And so there are different ways to do it, right? So a lot of things you can kind of rely on post hoc. Um, I feel like I just snapped out of something. Uh, you could chalk that up to memory problems. So maybe it was that you were just uh, thinking about things that were so unimportant that you just don't remember what they were. Uh, we do have this idea of mental time travel where with mind wandering you can be thinking about something without being aware of it, but then asked at a later time, you can go back and say what you were thinking of even though at that first moment you weren't aware of it. Um, and we find that people uh, aren't aware of anything, but again, it could just be such a low level thing. Uh, another way to get at it is through just doing in the moment probes which kind of uh, gives people, like, it would have to be so unmemorable that they forget about it in a matter of milliseconds, uh, which again is possible but less likely, um, or we can look for behavioral outcomes. And so in the procedures we're using, we try to minimize uh, some of these problems. Um, despite this refrigerator door problem, people seem to be convinced that this mental state exists. Um, not everyone. Uh, and <laughs> Psychologists and philosophers are more convinced than uh, most people that it doesn't. Uh, but when you talk to people, um, for example, like teaching undergrad classes and things like that, people are like, oh, yeah, I go blank all the time, other than the one or two people who are like, no, that never happens. And they're like, shh, don't worry about it. It's fine. Um, and then you keep talking as if it's uh, definitely the truth. Um, but it seems something like something that's kind of common in lay theories of things. Um, so we see it as something that happens just in general time. Say you're at a talk um, and sitting there listening to somebody. Uh, people have the experience of just kind of going blank. Not even they're just they're daydreaming about something else. They're just nowhere. Um, hopefully that's not happening to any of you guys, but I'm not yet naive. Chances are it is. Um, we also see it perhaps when we're at work. The same thing happens. Perhaps you're preparing this talk. Um, and although nothing has really studied mind blanking per se, uh, you do find the studies that allow people to kind of offhandedly report their mental contents that they report being blank. So in a mind wandering study, the school of Reichel and Halvern study, um, usually they just asked whether or not they're wondering, but in this one they actually asked for the specific contents of thoughts and they found that 18% of the time people said they weren't thinking about anything at all. Um, the watson Sherrick study found that uh, going blank is the second most common form of attentional lapse. Uh, second only to distraction by an internal stimulus. Uh, it's actually more common than distraction by an external stimulus, which I think is interesting. And then you have sort of a descriptive experience sampling studies, um, which also find reports of the mind being blank. Um, they're rare in those studies, but they show up. Uh, you also have uh, the experience of mind blanking you really, really don't want to. So. A lot of people are terrified of public speaking, um, and it's because they think their mind is going to go blank. And you might say, "This is a different kind of blanking." They're just afraid they're going to remember, or they're afraid that they're going to forget what they're supposed to say. But this is how they describe the experience. And actually, uh, a study 30 years ago found that public speaking is people's biggest fear. Um, and I think 41% of people said that public speaking was their biggest fear, compared to 18% of people who said that death was their biggest fear. Uh, so basically, talking in front of people is twice as terrifying um, as dying, turns out. Um, and the biggest reason people give is that they think they're going to just get up there and go completely blank. And then they actually replicated that uh, a few years ago. So this is like a long-lasting fear of getting up in front of people and talking. Um, we also have the opposite. So when we want to go blank, we want to rid our minds of thoughts. Uh, for example, if we really want to go to sleep, the times when we really want to get rid of all of our thoughts, we want our minds to go blank, um, are the times that we have the biggest trouble doing so. Um, you also see this in some forms of meditation. Uh, but what these examples sort of suggest is that when we really don't want to go blank, uh, we have trouble abstaining from the blank mind, and we do want to go blank, uh, we have trouble doing that. And this sounds a lot like, um, well, there we go. The ironic processes of mental control. Um, and so for those of you that aren't familiar with that, I'll explain it in a second. Um, 
But one thing to know is that a lot of research has been done on the ironic processes of mental control, but it's usually focused on contentful mental states, specifically thoughts, emotions, things that have content and qualia. And the blank mind is weird because it's defined by its lack of those things. Um, so what we really wanted to do in the present research was apply the concepts behind these ironic processes to mental control of the blank mind. So do the same processes that apply to mental states that are defined by content also apply to a, a potential mental state that's defined by its lack of content. Um, and so this is kind of a way of demystifying this refrigerator door problem of the blank mind. We just treat it like a thought like any other mental state. And if we do that, then we can know kind of the rules that apply to it and use that as a way of looking into uh, what happens when consciousness is gone. And if we know how to manipulate uh, these things and measure these things, then we can compare times when we have uh, consciousness in a sense uh, to times when we don't and look for differences between those two types of states. So I'm going to talk about some studies. But first, I'm going to talk about ironic processes as I promised. Uh, a lot of you guys are probably familiar with this. This is the, the duck rabbit. Um, it's both a duck and a rabbit. If, if you're having trouble seeing it, uh, look here. So this could be a duck beak. You see the duck? It's kind of facing this way. Does everybody see the duck? OK, cool. Um, it could also be a rabbit's ears. So the rabbit's facing the opposite direction. has a little tiny, cute mouth. Um, but it's there as well. So everybody see the, the rabbit? Awesome. Um, it's actually easier to see the duck than the rabbit, but they're, they're both there. Um, an example of uh, ironic processes is if I ask you to try really hard not to see the duck. Um, and then you look at it, and most people can see nothing but a duck. Um, and because you're trying so hard not to see it, that's what you see. And this is interesting to me because most things are about trying not to think certain things, but this is kind of at a perceptual level, which is pretty cool. So you're trying not to perceive this thing, you do perceive this thing. So things that can be perceived in one of two ways, uh, what you try to avoid perceiving is what you, what you do perceive. And so they actually did the study and they had people uh, hold down a key for how long they saw the duck. And like I said, on average with no instructions, about 60% of the time people are seeing a duck. But when they're trying really hard not to see it, they see it more often than that. And that difference is significant. And then when they're trying really hard to see it, they actually see it less often. So this says another thing about it is the things that we try to avoid uh, kind of pop into mind and the things that we try to attain uh, run away from us. So it's in both directions. Uh, basically, consciousness is playing tricks with us all the time. It's really annoying. Um, so this is a, a cool example. But there are examples from lots of other things. Uh, for example, uh, ooh, ooh, forbidden relationships, uh, racist thoughts. Uh, desire to quit smoking, uh, the more you try to not think about cigarettes, the more you think about them. Um, try not to tell secrets, so the harder you try not to tell a secret, actually the more likely you are to tell that secret. Uh, trying to go to sleep. Um, depression, so the harder you try not to be depressed, uh, the more depressed you tend to be, um, <laughs> which is a shame. Um, and white bears, which is what the original study was back in 1997. Um, so, well, it comes from a Dostoevsky idea about uh, trying not to think of a white bear. Now all you can think of is a white bear, which is weird because I don't walk around thinking about white bears all the time, but the second you tell me not to do it, that's the only thing I can think of. Um, so basically what we want to see is if the same thing happens with the blank mind. If trying really hard not to go blank makes us more often to go blank. And again, this is kind of comparing this contentless mental state to all these contentful mental states that cover a wide range of things. So you have perception, you have actions, you have emotions and you have actual thoughts. Um, and in so doing, um, we wanted to look at two different things. Uh, so when we want to avoid going blank, uh, such as when you're in front of a crowd of people, can we do that? Um, and we want to achieve it, can we do it? Um, such as when, you know, some forms of meditation, trying to go to sleep. Sometimes you know, if you just had a really stressful day, you kind of want to clear your mind of all thoughts. Is that a possible thing? Uh, and I should mention, uh, all the studies I'm going to talk about are part of a paper that I just checked during the break. It is uh, still under review at Psych Science. I wanted to make sure I was being accurate because there was a chance that you know got rejected in the last couple hours, but not yet. So um, hopefully never. Uh, so these are our studies with Dan Wagner that are under review at, at Psych Science. So uh, part one, uh, we're looking at the immediate ironic effects on attempts to avoid mind blanking. And so another thing I should mention is there are sort of two typical ironic effects. There's the immediate ironic effect 
That's usually when you're under some sort of cognitive load. So when you try to avoid a given mental state and you're under load, then that mental state shows up immediately. Um, there's also what's called a rebound effect. So if you're not under load and you're trying to avoid a mental state, but then you give up conscious control uh, in the time right after you give up conscious control, uh, that mental state just shows up all over the place. So it rebounds more so than if you've never, you've never tried to suppress it in the first place. So the first one we're looking at is immediate effects. I'm going to get some water while this does it. Cool. All right, so we had people complete a two-minute free thought period. And I think the, the structure of the task is important here um, because it, it speaks to ruling out uh, other sort of related states. Uh, we weren't asking them to come up with information, so it can't be the tip of the tongue thing, right? We weren't asking them questions, and so they weren't thinking about how they couldn't think of the answer to that question. Also, the free thought period is basically asking people to mind wander. And so this makes it impossible for people to confuse being off task with being blank. So they can't kind of confabulate mind wandering and uh, mind blanking because the whole task is to mind wander. So the only possible off task state is to not be thinking of anything at all. Um, and then they just clicked a tally counter any time. They noticed they had just been blank. So we told them, you know, you might not notice until you snap, snap out of it. Just when you notice that, um, let us know by clicking this tally counter. Um, so the design here was a two by three between subjects design. So we had a two level demand condition, uh, control and suppressed blanking and control condition. They weren't really told anything specific. And the suppressed blanking condition, they were asked to try as hard as they could to not go blank. And then we had a three level low condition. And the thing that's tough here is most manipulations of cognitive load ask you to think about something. So like count backwards from 1,000 by sevens. Uh, remember this really long digit span. Um, and those are going to stop you from being blank because the whole thing is asking you to think of something. That doesn't work, right? So we decided to use alcohol instead. Um, not just because of the pun with like being loaded is like a synonym for being really drunk. Although we did manage to work that into the paper, which was great. Um, but uh, alcohol has been shown to uh, basically have the same cognitive effects as other types of mental load. Um, so we sent uh, great research assistants out to public drinking areas around Boston. Uh, this is by Fenway. You can see, I don't know if, if how many of y'all are familiar with Boston, but uh, this little sicko sign here is uh, pretty famous. So this is out by Fenway. And we just surveyed them on the streets. Um, and so you kind of give up some experimental control here, right? Uh, because everybody is out on these streets. Um, however, it's good in a bunch of different ways uh, because uh, you're getting everybody in the same environment. There's not a lot of the pressure that you might have in the lab. Um, also, we didn't ask about age or whether or not they've been drinking or anything like that until after they'd done the study. Um, so we didn't have those demand effects of like, oh, I said I've been drinking a lot, I should act a certain way. Also, we didn't scare away people that were underage. Turns out a lot were. Um, but the other good thing is that's not our problem because that's the bartender's fault. Um, so what you can see here, what's circled is the tally counters, and they're actually sitting there clicking the tally counters anytime they, they notice that they have been blank. They're also, you can see they're all staring down. Um, oh, and this is to protect the innocent or not. There are little black bars over their eyes because I'm you know, being a good guy here. Um, they're staring at their feet uh, to kind of minimize external distractions. Um, so that's the basic setup of the study. And people were really happy to do it and pretty good at it. We actually had to exclude one person because she started eating a sandwich in the middle of the study. And we figured that probably didn't bode well for her results. Um, so we had a three-level low condition, and this was defined by the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, um, and kind of their definition of what's likely to bring your blood alcohol content to the point where you're intoxicated, um, being defined as like too intoxicated to drive, what would get you arrested, basically. Um, and it's the amount of drinks you've had in the past hour or two. So the first level was no drinks, so people who were just out hanging out hadn't had anything to drink. Um, the second was some drinks, so that was less than four for females, less than five for males and then the intoxicated level, which is greater than or equal to that number. Um, and again, our hypothesis was that people will be able to avoid going blank under low loads. So if we ask them to go blank, they're going to be good at it. But once they're loaded, so to speak, um, they'll be really bad at it. Uh, so here are the results. Uh, on the left, you're going to see the, the mean blanking, so how many times they said they went blank in this two-minute period. 
and then across our conditions. Uh, so uh, our first hypothesis was supported when people were asked to suppress blanking to not go blank um, under low load. They were good at it, um, and they were actually pretty successful at achieving that mental state and controlling their own mental states. Uh, same thing actually when they had some alcohol, but when they got really drunk, uh, you get this huge interaction effect such that when you're trying really hard not to go blank, you're more likely to go blank than if you weren't trying at all. Um, and that you're more likely to go blank in that condition than any other condition. And that is, uh, I believe, significant if my statistical knowledge uh, doesn't fail me. Um, so <laughs> the, the idea there being that there's this interaction between load and demand such that when they work together, um, just like these other mental states that, that we've looked at with ironic processes, the blank mind seems to be uh, subject to the same. So that is study one. Um, what is, what, what are we looking at like on time, by the way? You've got another 10 minutes. Okay, crap. So I'm gonna skip studies two and four and go to study three. Um, we also looked at the rebound effects, which I, I mentioned earlier, um, and I'll actually just go real fast. So we had people do another, a, free thought period, um, and we had them read beforehand and either suppress blinking or not, and we found that if people had been suppress, suppressing blinking before, um, here we go, eh, they were much more likely to go blinking afterwards. So suppressing blinking at time one leads to a rebound of the blank state at time two. Um, and again, that's significant. Um, so, in response to the first question, we want to avoid mind blanking, can we do it? The answer seems to be no. So uh, when we attempt to suppress the blank mind, um, you know, we can be successful at some times, as we saw in the first study, right, when people weren't under load. Um, if you are under load, you're not successful. But even those times when you are successful, this suggests that afterwards, the blank mind is going to rebound anyway. So you're kind of screwed. Uh, the question is whether you're screwed right now or in a few minutes. Um, when you're trying to achieve this mental state. So part two, when we want to achieve mind blinking, can we do that? And so this is the opposite. Um, and this is interesting because this hasn't really been studied before, the idea of ironic processes on trying to uh, attain a given mental state. Uh, but if you think about it, um, basically achieving a mental state X is the same as uh, avoiding all mental states that are, are not X. So it's sort of the inverse there. Um, so study three, we wanted to look at immediate ironic effects on attempts to achieve mind blanking. We also wanted to solve something of that refrigerator door problem I was talking about. So uh, the study one uh, kind of relied on post hoc self-report, which is an ideal. We do have like probe caught reports and things like that that I didn't show you. Um, but again, that's not necessarily how we'd like to do things. So we decided to use a memory measure in study three. Um, so we just asked participants to keep their eyes on a computer screen for two and a half minutes, and we were very specific that that's where their eyes should always be, and then we made sure that's where they kept their eyes. Um, this is what a computer looks like, in case uh, you're not familiar. Um, we use them for a lot of things. Um, and while their eyes were on the screen, uh, we had a two-by-two two between subjects design. So there are two demand levels, control or go blank. So either they didn't really have any specific instructions. We told them what mind blanking was, but we didn't say, you know, whether or not they should try to achieve it or avoid it or anything like that, or the go blank condition we said, you know, try as hard to go blank while you're keeping your eyes on the screen. Um, it might be difficult, but if you find yourself thinking of something, just try to go back to being blank. And then we had two load levels, um, which uh, was previously used in uh, a couple other ironic processes papers. The low load level was they just heard a constant tone over the computer speakers the whole time, and the high load, load uh, was they heard John Philip Sousa marches um, which have a lot going on, and so the idea being there's more stuff happening, and so it's harder to control what you're doing. And so while all this is going on, um, we were flashing words on the screen. There were 32 words, and once each one was flashed once. So they'd be sitting there, and it'd be something like that. Did you guys catch it? There's two of them on the screen, or result. They were all between one and three <laughs> syllables, and we like matched for word frequency and all that kind of thing. Um, and then we had a brief intermission and then a, a surprise recognition memory test. So we didn't tell them they were going to be tested on these words, but then we tested uh, to see whether or not they remembered seeing them. And they were simply asked whether or not the word was old or new. Um, so they were given some old words. This is an old one. Um, 
there are some new words, so that hadn't shown up. Um, and we're going to look at that. And so as our measure, we use this, there's supposed to be a prime there. We use D prime, um, which is basically a level, or a measure of awareness, comes from signal detection theory, which is better than just like strict uh, performance measures, like how many did you get right, how many did you get wrong, because you could have somebody who just said they had seen everything before, right? So it, what D prime does is it res uh, kind of adjusts for individual differences in uh, your strategy of responding. So if you're super cautious and you miss a lot of the ones that you had seen before, but you don't get like you don't say that you had seen some that you hadn't seen, um, then it's going to give you a better D prime score. Um, if you get all the ones correct that you had seen before, but also say you'd seen all the things that you hadn't seen, you're going to get a low D prime score. Um, so that's what we use. It's basically a signal to noise ratio, and that's how you compute it. Um, again, the hypothesis is that people will be able to intentionally go blank under low load, but not under high load. Whoop. And uh, what we found was exactly that. Um, and again, the interaction is significant. So under low load, this is when they're hearing that constant tone. Um, when people are trying to achieve blanking, uh, they actually seem like they're good at doing that. Uh, however, under high load, uh, these results are counterproductive. So when they're trying to go blank, they're not able to do so. And I think this matters uh, sort of in uh, practical terms because a lot of times when people are trying to go blank, they are under high load. Uh, for example, if you come home from a stressful day at the office, you might want to try to just clear your mind. However, stress has load-like effects. And so you're, the times when you especially want to go blank are the times when you're especially uh, unlikely to be able to do so. Um, let's see. So we're going to skip this guy. Um, but basically, we find a rebound as well. This will go. Here we go. Um, and again, when we want to achieve mind blanking, we're not good at it. So even if we're successful in the short term, uh, we experience this rebound in the long term. So looking at the two together, when we want to avoid it, when we want to achieve it, are we uh, capable of doing that? The answer seems to be no. Um, and then going back to one of the original questions, whether or not the blank mind is subject to ironic effects of mental control, the answer seems to be yes. And I think this is interesting. And in the last, like, probably 12 seconds, I'll tell you why. Um, it's suggested the blank mind might be, in some ways, like other content-filled mental states. And that's interesting because this is a mental state that's defined by uh, a lack of content, or at least of not being aware of what you're aware of, if you're aware of anything. Um, so from the point of somebody who's really interested in experience, this suggests that there is this mental state where we're not aware of anything. Uh, lots of times we kind of skip over it because it's, uh, in the words of William James, it's something that is, uh, it feels like it's continuous um, because we're not aware of when we're not aware. Um, but there might be these times uh, that happen and they actually act like other mental states. And that, I think, is important. So to put in context of the kind of title of the day, which is doing things because you feel like it, um, when the mind is blank, we're not attending to anything. Um, and so using the definition of consciousness that I set up beforehand, being conscious of something, um, not just levels of vigilance or levels of awareness or levels of consciousness, but actually consciousness of a specific uh, input uh, requires us attending to it. Um, but this lack of attention to things doesn't seem to correspond with the lack of action. So that suggests that... Um, you know, if we're trying to ask the question whether we do things because we feel like it, the answer is not always, if ever, which I don't think is particularly surprising. Um, and I think I wrote that down. Yeah. That's not particularly surprising. There's a lot of research out there suggesting that um, unconscious thought theory, automaticity, uh, think like alien hand syndrome and, you know, uh, hallucinations and schizophrenia and things like that. But I think what's cool about this research is that by demystifying the blank mind, treating it like a thought, what it's doing is it's giving us ways to both manipulate and measure this mental state. Um, and in so doing, we can use these methods to create the blank mind, measure the blank mind, and look for differences between times when people's minds are blank versus not, and see if there are any corresponding differences in their behavior and their experience. And so this is one way of getting a handhold on kind of the behavioral implications of at least feeling like you're conscious. Um, 
And so this is sort of between a lot of levels, ways to come at it. This is the first way um, that I'm aware of that is looked at it just in these strictly behavioral terms. And that should be it. So thanks to all these people.